Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Miglia, Director of Core Studies and Assistant Professor of History. This year, our community has read and discussed Marilyn's Ro Marilyn Robinson's truly luminous novel, Gilead, as part of our core book initiative. Core book is our common intellectual and spiritual experience centered around one key text that highlights themes from our Christ at the Core curriculum. Reading Gilead has been for us an act of contemplation. We've made the choice to slow down, to read, and to reflect on Robinson's writing. We've savored the literary and theological themes of this award-winning novel. So it's a privilege and an honor to welcome Marilyn Robinson today to campus. It's also a privilege to welcome down the hill Dr. Philip Riken, president of Wheaton College. Gilead happens to be, I think, one of President Riken's favorite novels, and one that he's written about often and reflected upon given his own vocation and calling to the pastorate prior to his service here at Wheaton College. Now before we begin, and I hand it over to Dr. Riken and to Marilyn Robinson, I'd like to just speak for a moment about Marilyn Robinson and the significance of her work. Robinson is the author of multiple nonfiction books and also of four novels. Those novels include Housekeeping, winner of the Hemingway Foundation Penn Award, Gilead, awarded the Pulitzer Prize, Home, winner of the Orange Prize, and Lila, winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award. Robinson is Professor Emeritus of the University of Iowa Writers Workshop. Her writing has captured the hearts of so many because of, I think, her beautiful prose and because of her unusual insight into the human condition. Now, I personally have been changed through the reading of her novels. I know many of you have had similar experiences as well. Reading Gilead prompted me to consider how I'm living out my ordinary daily life right here in the Midwest. Today's a cold and dreary day. It doesn't feel very spring-like, right? And it would be all too easy to forget to look up, to look around, and to watch for God's presence here on our ordinary Midwestern suburban campus. Let me use Robinson's words to illustrate this point from Gilead. The protagonist, John Ames, reflects, it has seemed to me sometimes as though God, the Lord, breathes on this poor gray ember of creation and it turns to radiance. But the Lord is more constant and far more extravagant. Wherever you turn your eyes, the world can shine like transfiguration. You don't have to bring a thing to it except a willingness to see. Only who will have the courage to see it? Robinson's Gilead is a call to courage, a call to see with clear eyes God's goodness shining in the most unexpected and mundane places. The good life can be small, it can be Midwestern, and it can be full of God's radiance even where they're suffering. I can't think of a better way to close our year-long conversation about Gilead than to do what we're doing right now. Here we are gathered as Christians, gathered as readers, ready to consider the human condition and God's extravagant goodness that shines around us. So please join me in welcoming Marilyn Robinson and Phil Riken. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming today. A year ago, Dr. Tim Larson was organizing the Theology Conference. He started to explain that we wanted to have a public interview of Marilyn Robinson. And probably before he could finish, I said, as president, I accept your generous offer to give this interview. So I'm taking advantage of uh, one of my prerogatives. Um, and I have with me my dog-eared, heavily annotated uh, copy of Gilead, uh, ready to ask some questions. I feel um, it's very appropriate to begin with a question related to America's long struggle with slavery and the legacy of racism in this country, really going from the abolitionists to Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, this, as you know, is April 4. At uh, just about two hours from now, 6.01, the bell from uh, Blanchard Tower will be tolling, as will bell towers in Memphis, Tennessee, and many other places around the country. 
um, marking 50 years uh, since Martin Luther King's assassination. That's a bell that would have first tolled during the Civil War. Um, Ameri Wheaton's founder, Jonathan Blanchard, was an abolitionist, very much fits what you might think of as the abolitionist character type, a John Brown, John Ames the first uh, kind of character. The abolitionists um, were calling for an immediate end to slavery, maybe could be accused at times of being inflexible, um, intemperate perhaps, militant certainly. Um, I'm wondering what you think some of the virtues of the abolitionist temperament might be and how are their sensibilities important for us today combating the legacy of racism and perhaps just uh, addressing other contemporary problems. Um, Use the microphone. Yes, the microphone. <laughs> I, I think it's hard for us, thank God, from this period to look back on what slavery actually was, to really realize what, what was at stake uh, in the uh, effort to eliminate slavery. Um, it was extremely brutal, and in some cases, uh, depending on the kind of agriculture that was practiced, uh, it was literally lethal. It literally worked people to death intentionally. Um, there's a great, you know, it must have been a terrible thing to watch. They, or, you know, in many places in the country, like in upstate New York or in, in Massachusetts, uh, Southerners, wealthy Southerners, would come north to escape the summer, and they would bring slaves with them, you know? Uh, people always talk as if this issue were something that would have been remote from places where there was not slavery practiced. But in fact, there was this continuous pressure to normalize and to extend slavery. That was what made the settlement of the Middle West so urgent, the fact that it could be organized around free labor rather than than uh, you know, being yielded to people who were continuously trying to press slavery into Illinois and Iowa and elsewhere. Um, I, uh, the slavery, if you do not pay your help, you could make a lot of money. And that was basically the genius behind the institution of slavery. So the idea that it could only flourish in the South, this is not true. It, did, it existed in the North for as long as we were under British law, one of the things that Americans don't know is that Britain was the great slave trader that brought uh, captured Africans into, into the colonies in the United States and into the, the British Caribbean. Um, and this is a, the fact of the, the British influence was very important for one thing because they nearly entered the war on the side of the South. And for another thing, because they did an extraordinary thing, they, they uh, ended or they began the ending of slavery in the British Caribbean in 1837, but they did it in the oddest way. They did it by paying slave owners extraordinary sums of money to basically to, ab <laughs> to abandon their colonies, you know, um, and leave the uh, Africans who had been brought there to, you know, cope as they could. Um, so the example of abolition that was available to people in America was to give a fantastic bonus to people who had participated as owners in slavery. And so what the abolitionists were saying is, no, it ends, it's done. If you, you've made your, the money that you made while it existed, you know, nobody owes you anything. Um, and this was taken to be radical. I think it's not radical. Um, I think that it ought to have gone farther and they should have gotten their 40 acres. I mean, why not, you know? But um, in any case, there was, we had a horrible war. There's no question about the fact it was a terrible war. When, when Lincoln was speaking on the battlefield at Gettysburg, there were still many, many unburied bodies on that field as he spoke. You know, um, so people were horrified in retrospect at what had happened in this country, and there was a huge uh, backlash and movement away from from the memory of the abolitionist movement. Um, and we lost a lot when we lost that memory, because they were probably the best egalitarians that this culture has ever produced. And if we could have 
retained and extended their understanding of gender relations, racial relations, many other economic relations, we would be in a much better place now. Thank you. When I ask uh, a question about calling, um, one of the reasons Gilead is such a good fit for us for our first year seminar is we want first year students thinking about not just career, that, that has its place, but really about calling in the, in the Christian sense of vocation. That's very important to John Ames as the protagonist. Um, it's really an extended reflection on his calling as a pastor. In at least one place, he also seems to be reflecting on his calling as a writer, not just his religious vocation, but he says, for me, writing has always felt like praying. I'm interested in your own sense of calling as a writer, maybe how that's developed. Um, it, can writing be a religious calling? Actually, not just the pastoral calling, but the writing calling. Can that be a religious calling? Um, and any advice you have for people that are thinking about their calling? Well, I mean, uh, one of the things that is remarkable about Christianity in general is that we have produced an enormous literature. Um, it's been true for centuries that people have felt precisely that writing was a religious vocation. You know, John Bunyan, the list is endless, you know. Um, I think that uh, I, I really, it's something that I talk about all the time, I think. <laughs> Don't tell me, don't confirm that opinion, but uh, <laughs> what you have to do is consider yourself to be a, a unique expression of what is humanly possible. You will, I mean, one of the things that's been absolutely true of my life, and which I certainly am grateful for, is that I, I know what I want to do. You know what I mean? I know what it is mine to do. I know what is not mine to do. I know things that are not using my capacities. Uh, things that, you know, time is precious, you know? And if you're trying to accommodate yourself to expectations that are not yours, or that are culturally defined for you in anticipation of you, um, then you're not being what God made you to be. And it's just not a sort of, uh, you know, unshackled individualism or something I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that we really are gifted and that our gifts are extraordinarily diverse and that no one can anticipate your gifts because they're unique to you. And so your vocation, the first vocation that you have is to try to understand who you are, you know? Um, Emily Dickinson talks about, uh, you know, the, the errand I came to flesh upon, you know? What is the errand you came to flesh upon? It's yours, not somebody else's, you know? And, and it's beautiful, and it has as much potential as you give it attention and possibility. Um, you are not in competition with anybody else. There's nobody else who can be you. <laughs> you know, your uniqueness is guaranteed so long as you respect it, you know? So that's what I, I mean, my deepest feeling is if you, if you find that you, something is so interesting to you that you put aside other things that are more practically important to pursue that interest, you're doing the right thing. So even when you are, um functioning in your sweet spot of your calling, the thing that God has given you to do, often there are still disappointments because you are not able to do it quite in the best way that you think it could be done. And that's certainly a struggle that John Ames has in Gilead. One of the images that, that I really love is this um, image of his boxes and boxes of sermons up in the attic. Uh, more than 2,000 sermons, more than 67,000 pages, maybe as much work as Augustine um, up in the attic. And it's, it's obviously valuable material. Um, when his wife comes down with pages from time to time, she's learning things. I think some, some of the really best passages in, in the novel are some of the scripture expositions that are coming out of those sermons. And yet, Ames himself has a deep ambivalence um, about it. Here is his best thinking, his, his best convictions, and yet I'm quoting from the novel here, so often I have known right there in the pulpit, even as I read the words, how far they fell short of any hopes I had for them. So um, 
maybe you never feel that way about your own writing. I would say that's possible. Um, but um, surely at times you've wrestled with some sense of disappointment, even in the midst of fulfilling your calling. And how should we think about those disappointments as Christians? How should we persevere through them, particularly if, as many students are on this campus, they're kind of perfectionist-oriented and have high expectations? How do we wrestle with that in our calling? Well, you know, high expectations are a way that you discipline yourself. They're very important, and you will fall short of them, you know. Um, I and it's it can be quite confusing because, I mean, normally I, I, I'm engaged in what I'm writing in a fairly positive way. You know, I think, well, I was not bad. You know, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's reassuring to me that I have, you know, that I feel as if I know something I can't articulate. That's a, you know, I mean, I, I hear recognition from the audience. Uh, and it's not only because it gives me something to try for the next time, it's because it gives me a much fuller sense of what it is to be the particular human being I am, from which I can extrapolate. We have these, our minds are extremely complex, multiple, you know? Um, and the part of your mind that tells you that you're falling short of some ideal of yourself is, is another interesting self, in effect, you know? It's a part of the richness of simply being a human consciousness in the world. Oh, thank you. This is just great wisdom for our students. I should mention this uh, interview is being live streamed. and I do want to give a very warm greeting to those who may be uh, following along with us um, on the internet. One of the uh, themes of our first year course, and I think this is another list of many reasons why Gilead's a great fit for our first year seminar, is because we're reflecting with students on the good life, uh, what the good life looks like in Christian perspective. And we're not thinking about that one dimensionally. Um, we're wanting to think, for example, about what is the place of suffering in the Christian life? And what is the place of Christian community in, in, in bringing consolation, helping us persevere through suffering? I just want to read, um, this is a, a brief quotation, Marilyn, from um, your essay on family, which is in the death of Adam. And I, I want to just ask a question that arises from it. Imagine that someone failed and disgraced came back to his family. Well, <laughs> imagine a novel like Gilead, for example. And they grieved with him and took his sadness upon themselves and sat down together to ponder the deep mysteries of human life. This is more human and beautiful, I propose. Even if it yields no dulling of pain, no patching of injuries, perhaps it is the calling of some families to console because intractable grief is visited upon them. I'm wondering if I can ask you to reflect on the role of community, not just family, but community. The, the, the church is a family in um, providing consolation for suffering. And, and how does that help us live the good life even in the context of suffering? Um, I think one of the most important things for people to do is to develop um, imagination in the sense of a sympathetic imagination. Uh, we can't, you know, there are some people who can comfort you and some people who can't, you know. And, and uh, to be the good comforter, you have to be somebody who has a felt imagination for the circumstance of the person being comforted. I think often uh, we kind of uh, sink into stereotype behavior. You know, this should, I'll pat him on the back, you know, this should be comforting. Um, but if it is insensitive, it is not. It can be an irritant rather than, than a reassurance, you know? Um, I think that the best comforters I know are people who in any instance have given a great deal of thought to what subtle thing, you know, what, what quiet, sustaining thing would comfort, you know? I think that churches are wonderful because they every we've made the great concession to one another that we're mortal, that we you know will 
see children baptized that we will not live to see married, you know, married. Um, that sort of thing. What, I mean, I don't think there's a, a situation in life where I feel more like I'm a human being among human beings than in a church. And because that's because the hymns and the sermons and so on acknowledge, you know, our human being, our human frailty, the transiency of our existence. Um, and I think that that gives people a, a good beginning to, to being capable of real, really comforting one another. Um, but I think we have to be careful of thinking that we have done it because we have made the conventional gestures, you know? So you talk, you were speaking about a sympathetic imagination, and I think what I, what I want to ask about is the role of, of literature potentially in cultivating. You talked about how the church is a place where we cultivate that kind of sympathetic imagination. So I think one of the things that um, Gilead does, particularly when paired with the other two novels, is it enables us to enter very deeply into people's stories and I think also sympathetically into their stories. And I think you see in John Ames somebody who's even prayerful about how can I be an instrument of grace in the life of this other person who is coming to, to, to visit with me. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how reading great literature, and particularly entering into those stories, how that can be a means for us to cultivate this kind of sympathetic imagination. Oh, I think it really can be. And I think that whenever you read a book that seizes on you, it's because the book has done exactly that. It has made you the compassionate observer or the, you know, even indignant observer or whatever else happens to be the subject. Um, I think that we don't, we're really kind of so immersed in literature of one kind and another that we don't even recognize it anymore for what it is, you know? I mean, you know, film, all that is just another form of literature, you know? Um, human beings have always generated narratives, and we just do it at a terrific, an inconceivable rate, you know? Um, and I think that there's a way in which that means that if we're reasonably selective about what we give ourselves to look at, it's as if we have kind of compounded human life. We've lived over and over and over again in certain ways, you know? Um, which I think is an incredibly rich privilege of people living in this time, an incredibly rich human privilege, because it has always been true that we have loved to listen to stories and invent stories and live vicariously in that way. It's beautiful, I think. You mentioned giving ourselves over to something and being selective in how we do that. And I wanted to ask a question that has to do with attentiveness, paying careful attention to things. I think this is something that, that your novels certainly demand. It strikes me that a lot, that they have a kind of leisurely pace to them. There are some dramatic events, even the occasional murder or betrayal usually viewed uh, through the lens of memory, so often off stage, but then it's the occasion of reflection. But a lot of the drama is interior, it's in conversation. So there's a demand on attention. I was very interested to read, I think a friend had pointed me um, to this quotation, which must be from one of your essays. In Calvinism, the great demand placed upon you is attention to God, to others, to yourself, uh, maybe an echo there of knowledge of God, knowledge of self uh, from the start of Calvin's Institutes. Everything that happens is the subject of, of contemplation. I think that's very important for us as a campus. Um, we're wanting to, to cultivate examined lives, not unexamined lives. And I'm, I'm interested to know maybe why you see attentiveness as especially Calvinistic. Uh, that wasn't necessarily a connection I would have made. But, but maybe more importantly, how can we cultivate this skill apart from reading beautifully written novels? Um, how do we cultivate this kind of attentiveness? Well, I think reality presents us with new objects of attentiveness continuously. You know, that's the whole charm of it, the whole dynamic of it. That's why time exists, probably. That's my, that's my speculation. <laughs> but um, I, you know, I mean, I did a very odd thing. I, I uh, was teaching a seminar on Moby Dick, which is absolutely full of, of theology. 
And so I thought, of course it has to be Calvinism, because of course that's where it came from and all the rest of it. So I went to the library and got Calvin's Institutes, and I, to their surprise, taught an entire graduate seminar, which was simply going back and forth between the Institutes and Moby Dick. They, they're very latitudinarian at the workshop about what you can teach. <laughs> but in any case, the, I mean, it, reading Calvin helped me read Melville, and reading Melville helped me read Calvin, you know. And one of the things that is true of Moby Dick is, if you have read it, is that there are this incredible blooming out from experience of, of things that present themselves like a challenge to metaphysical attention. And this is very Calvinistic. The thing that Melville does, of course, and Calvin would not disapprove, is that he deflates these images that seem to be some sort of Direct, you know, a, a, a glimpse of an ultimate reality. He deflects, deflates, and then another one blooms forth, you know? Um, and uh, this made me very aware of how, how Calvin talked about consciousness, you know, in the world of experience. Uh, and I think that, there, that Melville is deeply in his debt. Um, I've, I've talked so often about that beautiful part where he talks about anyone that you encounter is a question being asked you by God. And he, he merges all of these things together. It's a question that God has posed to you. The question is, what does God want from this encounter? The, the, the other thing is that the person that you encounter, of course, is an image of God. And for Calvin, that has such import that the person is in effect God. You know, that's what you are encountering. And he says, say he wants to kill you. Say he hates you. Say he's never done anything to deserve anything from you. You owe him everything, you know? And um, it, it's a, an extremely beautiful ethic that, that implies that any encounter in life is a, is a holy vision, you know? And that what it is asking from you is not just admiration, but also attention to the question, what does this moment want from me? What does God want from me? Um, I, there, I, you know, I've read quite a bit of theology. I think there's nothing more beautiful than that. I, I sense in your answer, your love for Moby Dick, your love for Calvin's Institutes. Um, I'm, I'm reflecting, there's a a little place in Gilead where John Ames is imagining people finding him dead with a book in his hand, and he's hoping it's maybe John Donne, George Herbert, uh, maybe uh, Bart's commentary on the Epistle to the Romans, or specifically Calvin's Institutes, Volume 2. Uh, I'm wondering if that's also your list, or if it's not, what, what would be your list? Maybe Fox's Acts and Monuments, except yeah. I would probably die from the effort of picking it up. <laughs> no, that would be a good list. Yeah. That would. <laughs> so I, I feel, uh, so let me, let me ask you this question. I have so many things I want to ask about, and actually every answer you give prompts another question. Um, this is a question, maybe you can help me out as a college president, because there's a lot of criticism of the liberal arts. Um, particularly the value of a liberal arts education, particularly by people that are thinking about higher education in a marketplace context, maybe a more commodified approach to higher education. But we believe strongly in the value of a liberal arts education. I assume that's also something that you would support. How would you make a case for the value of liberal arts uh, education? You know, you have to make the, the case. Of, I mean, people talk as if these were economic issues that were, in, you know, in, in, to be considered. Um, in the, you know, if you were to look at a period in American history when the, when the economy exploded in a positive sense and when the wealth of the country rose precipitously, it was the period after the GI Bill where there was a huge expansion of of college education relative to the size of the population. It was a bill that was passed uh, by Congress to send the, G the returning soldiers from the Second World War to college. Um, 
the, you know, it's like that passage I quote from Tocqueville, you know, it's like, you know, light rising on the world, the, the competences and so on that, that become realized under the light of this, um, you know, always enlarging universe of knowledge, always enlarging in itself and always spreading through, through the population in a way that also enriches it, you know. Um, we have to insist on it. There are people who are going to say, you know, I mean, that part of the people that have stacked our lives with college debt will then say, you have to get a job immediately and nobody's going to hire you because you know something about the Peloponnesian War. <laughs> <laughs> But A, they're trying to, they're, they're saying you are bought and paid for. You simply have to do what the economy seems to be demanding of you, which is a huge session of your individual human freedom. Um, and the other thing is that if you talk to, you know, law schools, you know, professional uh, in education of that kind, or medical schools. We have a huge medical school in Iowa. What do they want? They want people to teach them writing. Writing is absolutely essential to thinking. You know, it's a feedback loop, you know? Um, they want to have, you know, people with a wide enough range of experience to be able to be articulate in difficult situations and so on, you know? Um, the humanities humanize. They are very well named. They are the means by which we receive a tremendous treasury of human experience, which can always be enlarged. Um, the, you know, and, and the, I'm not saying this at disparagement of science. I'm not saying it as the disparagement of anything that is not purely utilitarian. And frankly, not much is if it's taught well, you know. Um, it, I mean, it's one of those bad ideas. It's one of those cultural fads that spreads, you know, like dumbing down, these kinds of things, you know. The post-literate world, are you kidding me? It's, <laughs> you know, I, literacy is way too useful for people to, you know. But in any case, <laughs> so I, I think I've ended that statement. <laughs> So I was, uh, I was coming back from Memphis today, and to my surprise, TSA actually wanted to pull out everybody's books. I, I don't know, suddenly it's a book thing, and um, one of the TSA people said, oh, you know, nobody reads anymore anyway. Well, they'll, they'll find out how many people read. It's going to change my quality of life if I have to pull out all my books every time I fly. Um, you, um, you mentioned there um, just something you, you, you're talking about. Uh, doctors wanting to learn how to write. It reminds me a little bit what your comments there of something um, John Ames says, which is probably John Ames channeling Marilyn Robinson. Um, I, I write to know what I think, but then also in the process of writing, my thinking changes. It actually, that very process uh, influences and affects your thinking. Uh, I have to ask about uh, predestination and salvation. And uh, the reason I feel I have to ask about it is because that dialogue is so central to Gilead, and then we get three different angles, at least, on that same conversation in the different novels, which is just, um, I just think, something um, exceptional. And I think very relevant for Wheaton students, because most Wheaton students have gone back to the dorm and had a long late night conversation about predestination, election, salvation, all of these topics, and um, probably can relate to what John Ames says, which is, I've talked this talk this topic up and down without one iota in advancing my understanding. Uh, some students can probably relate to Glory, who says, um, you know, this is an argument, and, and Boughton, I think, says, no, it's not an argument, and she says, just wait five minutes, it'll be an argument. <laughs> um, but but you've, part of your sort of life as a public intellectual has been writing a lot about Calvinism, about the sovereignty of God and how it affects not just personal lives, but it's an idea with consequences for public life. So what has been, why has that been such an important theme for you um, doctrinally and practically um, in your writing? Um, what should we draw from its central place in, in the Gilead novels? I think it's a very interesting question. I mean, what, what I have kind of concluded from thinking about it is that the problem is we know nothing about the nature of time, you know? I mean, any self-respecting 
physicist or whatever will tell you, we know nothing about the nature of time, why it only goes in one direction, and all these kinds of things, you know? Um, and um, I, I think that there is a shapeliness. I think that there is a way in which, you know, actions, choices form themselves over time. We don't act randomly, you know? Um, which, which to me sort of implies that time in some sense exists simultaneously with itself. It's not sequential in the way that we experience it. So having said that, <laughs> no really, I mean I think that's the, I mean because every major theologian except for John Chrysostom and John Wesley has believed in predestination. Um, uh, Ignatius of Loyola believed in predestination. There is no, there is no place to step outside of that universe, basically, you know, and it's because anything else uh, minimizes the, uh, you know, the power of God, you know. So, um, so, it seems to me as if that's a place where the greatest minds, Augustine and all of them, Calvin, run up against this problem that in Christian terms is insoluble, and in terms of what we understand about the nature of being is also insoluble, which is fine. I mean, we don't assume, you know, we don't assume that a final mechanistic description of reality should be possible. I don't believe we think that. But if you look at people who were you know, the precursors for the Reformation and then also the writers of the Reformation, they tend to emphasize predestination, you know, early and often. You know, John Huss in Bohemia, his book on the church, the whole first part is about predestination. Luther wrote about it in very strong terms. Calvin, of course, is famous. One of the things that's odd is that it's been used as a polemic against Calvin, but he's simply typical. Of, of major uh, theologians in the fact of having written about it. So, I mean, this is one of these artificial crosses that people bear, you know. Being a Calvinist does not mean you're peculiar in the sense that your major theologian thought about this. They all did. <laughs> they all did. He just didn't, he's, he's it's, you know, it's like uh, Cromwell talking about paint me words and all, you know. Calvin said, this is a doctrine of the church. We have to talk about it. Ignatius of Loyola said, this is a doctrine of the church, don't talk about it, <laughs> you know. In any case, uh, but it, it raises an interesting question. The reason that all the reformers f foreground it in the way that they do is because they're arguing against the idea prevalent then that the, that the church had the means of salvation, you know, that if you do thus and so, you will, you know, uh, that a sort of ritualized idea of salvation that put the church in the place of God from the point of view of the reformers. And they, you know, to, to move people back toward the idea of omnipotence, divine omnipotence, and to, to end what they saw as perhaps a corrupt cycle of spending money, uh, you know, doing things that were, uh, intended as, as acts that would ensure your salvation. Um, and so it, it really is a way of, of uh, making the argument that God, it is God that determines these issues and not any human institution. I guess to connect it back to the novel, Jack says, this is a doctrine of the church, let's talk about it. Glory says, that's a doctrine of the church, let's not talk about it. <laughs> and Lila says, no, we really do need to talk about it, you know, particularly in the context of salvation. So I'm going um, to try this as a question, um, and hopefully it'll be enough like a question that it's something you can comment on. So I, I was fascinated to read some years ago, there's a law review article about Gilead, which says this is really tracing the story of Protestantism in America. You know, abolitionism, Christian orthodoxy, uh, Ames has a brother who drops the S from his name, so Jonathan Edwards is out. He goes off to Germany, becomes an atheist. There's some kind of commentary there on liberalism, I think. Um, so th th there's a sort of argument that this is what's happening, whether super intentionally or somewhat less intentionally. The question I want to ask about all of that, if you want to comment on that, I'd love to hear something on 
that. But the question I wanted to ask is, how do we make living out Christian orthodoxy attractive? Because I think many people in our culture would say, orthodox Christianity, that's unattractive. But here is a novel where I think it is so attractive a Christian like John Ames, trying to live out the Christian life even imperfectly, but it's deeply attractive. How, how can we sort of live the Christian life in the spirit of a, a John Ames? Maybe that's the question. I, you know, the word above all words is grace. And uh, insofar as orthodoxy runs counter to grace, and I think we feel that, we feel the injury we're doing to ourselves when we depart from that standard. It, is, it becomes unattractive. And the, you know, I don't know of grace except for, you know, in a certain aesthetic sense, I don't know of it being active in any other field of thought. But it is a profoundly attractive concept. And it is a a, a strongly implied aesthetics of, of personal behavior. And I think that if, if, if we attempt to think about any Christian orthodoxy or behavior or gesture in terms of grace, whether Jesus or whether God would recognize it as having grace in its impulse, that makes Christianity beautiful. The departures from it make Christianity repellent, simply a fact to be faced. So I have two more questions that I want to ask. I'm going to ask one of them now, but we do have a few minutes, and Marilyn Robinson has generously invited questions from the audience. We've got a couple of microphones set up. Please make the questions fairly brief, to the point, um, and you can start making your way there. I wanted to ask this question. So my, my own conviction is that part of living a good life is preparing to die. That, that actually that's a vital part of living a good life. And that's a theme that runs all the way through Gilead. Um, obviously, John Ames is preparing to die. There are age-related and medical, medically related reasons for that. Um, I also happen to think, I wonder if you agree with this, that um, college students, it's not too early to think about the end of life and how you're going to live your life in, in view to that. Um, how should we think about death? Is thinking about death, can it be part of the good life? What are, what are some of your thoughts about that? I, I, you know, I've, <laughs> I think I said somewhere, my brother said to me that Jonathan Edwards had said, never entertain a thought that you would not entertain on your deathbed. And I was probably 17 when he told me that. <laughs> but I never forgot it, you know. <laughs> um, I, I don't, you know, I do, th I don't know how long it's been true. I think maybe for a very long time that I have thought about my mortality a good deal, partly because it sort of reminds you that there is a limit <laughs> to time. There's a limit to opportunity. You know, if you want to do well by someone, do it now, you know, that sort of thing, you know. Um, the, um, I don't know, it's, it's, you know, what is the word that I want? A short supply of anything makes it valuable, doesn't it, you know? And we have, you know, I mean, I'm 74 and three quarters. I'm supposed to begin a precipitous decline in about three months. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, it is something that I, I do reflect on probably, you know, more often than the national norm. But <laughs> I find it interesting, frankly. And I find the way that uh, being reoriented so that, you know, when the rain falls on me, I think this, this is one of few times that rain will again fall on me, you know. And it transforms the experience. It's, it makes it poignant and lovely, you know? Um, so, I mean, I'm very fortunate. I'm very glad to have lived a long life. And now that I'm beginning to see that a lot more life is behind me than is in front of me, it, it, the changes that it makes in my perspective are lovely and interesting. Would love to ask from there about rain imagery and Gilead, but we press on to audience questions. <laughs> 
Hi, I just wanted to thank you, first of all, for coming here. I think I speak for everyone when we say this is pretty awesome to have you here speaking to us. Um, I wanted to ask, you said um, about knowing a thing that you can't articulate. Um, as someone who hopes to make something artistically or work artistically, how do you live and work within that place of unknowing, um, of living in something that you can't articulate? Habit is an element for me. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, one of the things that I tell my writers all the time, the human brain is the most complex object to exist in the universe, so far as we know. And everybody in this room has one, you know? Which is an absolutely remarkable thing to consider. Everyone individually has one, you know? And it is so complex that it's only by trying, pushing, you know, how can I articulate this? Or this doesn't sound right. What could I know to make it more persuasive to me? Then you realize what your mind is really capable of, how much more memory it has. It has now, if you just find out how to tap into it. That sort of thing. That's one of the things that's fascinating about writing, how much you find out you actually know, you know? Um, but in any case, uh, if you, you become interested in your own mind as a rich interlocutor with yourself, and I have no idea how you make that distinction, but it's very real. <laughs> if you be interested in the workings of your mind and then know, well, this is something my mind is offering me, an intuition, you know? And then you, you think, what is there? And you might know. When I'm going to start writing a novel, I never have a plot or anything in mind. I simply have a sensation in my mind that something, some detail, is the beginning of something novel length, you know? I, I feel all the time like my mind has a life that I have imperfect contact with, you know? But, but the thing about, for example, never satisfying your own hopes as part of this larger life of the mind, very interesting. Yeah. Ms. Hemphill. Hi. Hi. Um, in Gilead, there's this fascinating scene where um, Jack wants to be convinced by John Ames um, about Christianity, but uh, John Ames uh, isn't willing to engage in that argument um, because he doesn't find argumentation to be terribly convincing. I'm wondering if that has anything to do with your philosophy of Christian witness, and um, if you've got anything to say about that. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, I mean, John Ames, of course, is aware that Jack Bowden has heard all this language all his life, you know, and would have, if it had resonated with him in the way that he wishes it had, you know, it would not re require another articulation. I think that one of the hardest things about Christianity, perhaps always and certainly now, is that language is used without care. Um, it, has, it has shrunk down and hardened, you know. Um, and, you know, if people are, do not have an independent intuition of God, it can sound completely alien. And it can sound uh, uh, coercive. You know, I ha you have to subscribe to the meaningfulness of my words, you know. Um, I, that's one of the reasons that I write so much about religion, because I feel as if it has to be broken out of that kind of calcified language and given a wider context so that it can be actually meaningful to people who are not in the first place familiar with it or don't find it uh, approachable. Let's go over to this microphone. We'll just alternate. Thank you. Dr. Robinson, one of the things that is seen across your, um, your novels is this tension between domesticity and rootedness and home, uh, and then characters that are maybe called towards a wildness or what Sylvie refers to as drifting and housekeeping. And I'm wondering if you can kind of comment on that tension um, and its implications for a religious faith or perhaps the good life. That's one of those things that I repeat. <laughs> and then I think, oh, there I am again, you know. <laughs> In a way, I'm speculating. But um, 
it, it seemed to me when I was writing Housekeeping that, which was the first finished piece of fiction I ever wrote, that uh, there was a terrible tendency to, to simplify characters in fiction. You know, and you're working with, if you're working with bad assumptions about character, then you, it can't go anywhere interesting, you know? And it seemed to me that one of the things that is true, that is part of human reality, is that they, uh, they live a life they have chosen in awareness of all the lives they have chosen against, not chosen, you know? Um, and I think that a lot of people, for example, find two opposed things both extremely attractive, you know? And, and abandon, you know, abandon either domesticity on the one hand or rootlessness on the other, but without e excluding them from their minds or from their fantasies or dreams. Uh, and, and in a way, this opposition seems to me to be an aspect of human complexity that's always fascinated me. Yes, ma'am. Hi. I've been reading the poet uh, Mary Oliver, and some of the things that you've been saying today have really re reminded me of her poems and the kinds of themes that she wrote about. And I was wondering if you could talk about um, poetry and um, the poets that you like to read and where you think reading poetry should fit into our um, reading life. Uh, well, you know, that is a matter of, uh, one of the things that's very striking about, you know, like 19th century America is how much poetry was written. And it was published in newspapers, you know. I mean, Emily Dickinson was published in the Springfield Union. And this is, this is considered by us to be ironic in some way, or, but there was a big appetite for poetry that was satisfied by farmers, almanacs, and everything in the world. Um, poets were sort of superhuman figures in the 19th century imagination. Um, and I, I don't know why we've, to a great extent, lost that. It's interesting to think about. Um, I, you know, I, Shakespeare was my special field in academically, but before that, 19th century American. And I love Walt Whitman and I love Emily Dickinson and, I love Wallace Stevens, and you know, there are so many very fine poets and so little time. <laughs> but people choose, you know. This will be our last question from the floor, and then I've got a closer. All right. Um, a great deal of Gilead feels to be expressing from John Ames to. Um, to his, his little kid, um, the folk memory of him and his father and his grandfather, their collective experiences, especially in the first part of the book. Um, and I know in my life, I've not had exposure to folk memory like that. I haven't had the lessons of my uh, father and my mother and their father and mother taught to me. And do you see that? Have you seen that change over time in American society? And do you think that has um, impacted our culture in, in ways and how we might be able to get some back that we may have lost? That's a very interesting question. Um, I, you know, it's, it's just, I realize sometimes how much of what I received from my own family in terms even of, of local dialect and so on, I just never mentioned to my own children. I remember when I, my, my mother's father homesteaded, you know, and all this sort of thing, and, and um, I used to just try to pry information from him. And there are little tiny vivid details from time to time when he got tired of shooing me away. Um, it, it's, not part of the, it's not part of the custom now, it seems. And it's hard for kids to know the value of what someone might be trying to tell them, you know? I mean, it's the kind of thing that I think we should do consciously. Because I think people, if, if by some means it happens to have been slipped into a child's consciousness, it's something that he or she treasures, typically. I want to end with a question about the good life and the life to come. 
Um, some of the, to me, some of the most beautiful um, little moments in, in your novels express a longing for the life to come. Let me just give a couple examples, and I'm building up to a question here. Here's, here's a very famous one from Housekeeping. When does a berry break upon the tongue as sweetly as when one longs to taste it? And when is the taste refracted into so many hues and savors of ripeness and earth? And when do our senses know anything so utterly as when we lack it? And here again is a foreshadowing. The world will be made whole. And here's another one from uh, Gilead. Um, I mean, every time I read the novel, I could just stop right here and just enjoy this for a good long time. In eternity, this world will be Troy, I believe. And all that is past here will be the epic of the universe, the ballad they sing in the streets. Um, this is a perspective. This maybe gets back a little bit to what you were saying about time earlier and the extension of time. I think there's a perspective there that assumes not only a new heavens, but a new earth. Uh, there's a connection there. Um, there's another place in Gilead where there's a kind of cautionary word, and Reverend Ames says, uh, look, we know nothing about heaven, or at least we know very little. Calvin says we shouldn't speculate about it, so we, should, we need to be careful here. Um, but I'm st I still wonder, um, what kind of literature do you suppose people will write in heaven? Um, how does our appreciation for the arts, our love for beauty, our capacity as creators, um, how, to what extent is that part of our eternal nature? And, and maybe what are some of your hopes and aspirations for the life to come as a writer, as an artist? Well, you know, I, <laughs> I was listening to your bells ringing this afternoon, and they're all, you know, the Christmas, I mean, the Easter hymns. And they all end, hallelujah, 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 you know. <laughs> and I, you know, the, and usually they say this is what one will sing in heaven and what the angels will sing and all the rest of it. And I think that can't be literally true. <laughs> but perhaps if there's a place in heaven for the arts, that will be the hallelujah, you know. I think that would be very nice. I mean, look, look at Bach, you know, all for the glory of God. It would be so, so possible. You've been very generous with your time. It's great to have you on campus. Will you please join me in thanking Marilyn Robinson? Thank you.